in our world. We're surrounded by monuments to our own genius. Skyscrapers that pierce the clouds, bridges that span impossible gulfs, and machines that think faster than we can. We see these as the peak of a long, steady climb. But in the shadow of all that steel and glass, there are ghosts of another kind of genius. A forgotten genius, born not in labs or billion-dollar factories, but in the mud and desperation of a world lit only by fire. This is the story of a machine that changed history. A machine that didn't just grind grain, but reshaped whole societies, challenged the power of kings, and laid the foundation for the industrial world we know. But this machine wasn't built of high-grade steel. It was built from the resourcefulness of an age we've all but forgotten. Imagine building a machine, a giant that could power an entire village using local timber and stones scavenged from old ruins. This isn't fantasy. This is the story of how medieval communities and their skilled craftsmen, often learning through apprenticeship, became master engineers and how their incredible windmills forever changed the world. The Tyranny of the Quernstone Before the silhouette of the windmill rose against the European sky, the rhythm of life for millions was dictated by a relentless grinding sound. It was the grating of stone on stone, and it echoed in every single dwelling. This was the sound of the quernstone, and it was the sound of human labour at its most brutal. To understand the revolution that was coming, you have to put yourself in the world it replaced. For most people back then, Life was a cycle of planting, harvesting and processing. The staple of every diet was bread. But you can't eat raw grain. To get its nutrition, it had to be pulverised into flour. For centuries, the main tool for that job was as simple as it was unforgiving. The quernstone was a small, hand-operated mill made of two circular stones. The bottom stone was stationary. The top one was turned by hand, pushed and pulled in a wearying circle. A person, usually a woman, would pour grain into a hole in the top stone and just grind and grind and grind. It sounds almost rustic, but the reality was a form of daily physical torment. Historical accounts suggest this one task could eat up two or more hours of a woman's day. Another estimate is even more stark. A typical family might need nine hours of hard manual grinding every week just to get enough flour to survive. Imagine that, nine hours a week, every week, in a repetitive muscle straining task. The stones were heavy, the motion unnatural and exhausting. It was a tax paid not in money, but in time and energy. A village couldn't grow beyond its ability to feed itself, and that was limited by the inefficiency of the quernstone. Every hour spent grinding was an hour not spent on other vital tasks. It was a hidden break on progress, a constant drain on human energy. Of course, a better solution existed. The water mill. Where the geography was right, a river's power could turn massive millstones with incredible efficiency. But the water mill was a fickle servant. What if your village was on the flat, sprawling plains of northern Europe? What if your stream was too sluggish or froze solid for half the year? For huge parts of the population, the water mill just wasn't an option. And besides, water rights were jealously guarded. Rivers belonged to the feudal lord or the local monastery. To build a mill, you needed permission, and that came at a price. The Lord owned the mill, and his tenants were often legally forced to use it, paying a hefty tax of their grain the mulcher for the privilege. The water mill, for all its power, was often just another chain of feudal obligation. So the problem remained. How do you feed a growing population and break free from the tyranny of the quernstone when the rivers won't cooperate? The answer wasn't in the ground. It was blowing, unseen, right over their heads. They just had to get clever enough to catch it. A whisper on the wind. The idea of harnessing wind wasn't new. Sailors had used it for centuries. And far to the east, in 9th century Persia, horizontal windmills were already grinding grain and drawing water. But the idea didn't travel to Europe on a clean, direct path. It had to be radically reimagined for a different world. The European vision was for a vertical windmill, one that would stand tall, its sails turning like a great wheel. The first verifiable evidence of these windmills pops up in the late 12th century, almost at the same time in the windy coastal regions of northern France, Flanders and eastern England. One of the earliest solid records points to a windmill in Yorkshire, England in 1185. 
We have to pause here and appreciate what a monumental leap this was. In a world defined by what you could touch, where power came from an ox or a river, building a machine to capture an invisible force was revolutionary. The wind was often seen as chaotic and destructive. To see it as a potential servant, a tireless worker to be tamed, that was an act of pure genius. This wasn't the work of a single inventor. This was folk engineering at its finest, born from communal need and grassroots ingenuity. Imagine the scene in a small village. The harvest is in, but the long grinding season is ahead. Then someone, a carpenter who's watched a ship sail, a farmer with a mechanical mind, proposes something that sounds like madness. Let's build a giant. A wooden creature, taller than any building, that will catch the wind and do the work of a hundred hands. The risks were huge. There were no blueprints, no textbooks. Failure meant wasting precious time and resources. And yet, they did it. In village after village, communities pooled their courage. They looked at the wind, not as an obstacle, but an opportunity. It was an element that, unlike the rivers, couldn't be owned by a distant lord. The wind blew for everyone. The decision to build a windmill was more than practical. It was an act of collective hope. They were about to turn local materials and pure ingenuity into the machine that would define their landscape. The anatomy of a resourceful giant. Building a medieval windmill was an epic of resourcefulness. These weren't factory stamped machines. Each was a unique creation, a testament to the local environment and the skill of its builders. To us, they look quaint, but they were feats of advanced mechanical engineering built by skilled craftsmen using hand tools, intuition, and the best materials they could get. The story starts with the earliest design, the post mill. The post mill, a wooden colossus. Imagine a small wooden house. The buck, balanced on a single massive leg. This was the post mill. Its defining feature was as simple as it was ingenious. The entire body of the mill, with all its machinery, could be rotated to face the wind. The whole structure was balanced on a colossal central post, a single mighty tree trunk that had to be felled, shaped and hauled into place. Finding a tree of that size and quality was the first great challenge. The post didn't just sit on the ground. It was supported by a trestle foundation. But here's the clever part. The post didn't rest directly on the cross timbers, which would risk fracture. Instead, it was suspended just above them by four diagonal struts, distributing the immense weight onto four sturdy piers. These piers were often made from locally available stone, sometimes repurposed from old ruins where available. It was a brilliant solution of forces that ensured stability. Once the post was up, the buck was built around it. Think of it as a compact, two-story workshop. And this is where that resourcefulness really shines. The wood used was often the best that could be sourced locally, and sometimes included massive beams salvaged from old barns or dismantled ships. Every piece had a history. To turn this whole structure, which could weigh tons, the miller used a long tail pole. By pushing this massive lever, he could pivot the entire building on its post, aiming the sails right into the wind. It was a crude but brilliant system. The guts of the machine, gears from the forest. Inside the creaking body of the post mill was a symphony of wood and stone. At its heart was the wind shaft, a huge wooden axle that held the sails. Mounted on it was the brake wheel, a massive wooden gear that could be 10 feet across. Its teeth weren't carved from the wheel itself. Instead, millwrights would drill holes and hammer in replaceable gear teeth called cogs, carved from tough hardwoods like applewood. If a tooth broke, you just knocked out the old one and fitted a new one. It was a modular, repairable system born of pure necessity. This brake wheel turned a smaller gear called a wallower, which changed the rotation from horizontal to vertical and increased the speed, a simple one-speed transmission. This drove the runner stone, the top millstone that did the grinding. The millstones were the most expensive part of the whole machine. They had to be made from a specific hard stone, like French burr which was often imported at great expense. The miller would chisel a complex pattern of grooves into the stone's face. These grooves didn't just grind, they channeled the flour from the centre to the edge where it could be collected. And the sails? They were simple wooden lattice frames. Over these, the miller stretched sailcloth. While tough canvas or linen was preferred, it's plausible that in a pinch, any sturdy fabric might have been used. Adjusting them was dangerous work. The miller had to stop the mill, 
climb out onto the sails and manually furl the cloth to control the power. The tower mill, a stone revolution. The post mill was brilliant, but its size was limited. By the late 13th century, a more powerful design appeared, the tower mill. The innovation was separating the machinery from the building. The main body was now a fixed tower, built of much sturdier materials like stone or brick. This meant the mill could be bigger, hold more grain, and support larger machinery. Now only the very top of the mill, the cap, needed to turn. This rotating cap was a major upgrade, running on a greased track that made it far easier to move. But the true genius that perfected the tower mill came much later with one of the earliest forms of automation, the fantail. Patented in 1745 by an English blacksmith named Edmund Lee, the fantail was a small secondary windmill mounted at the back of the cap. Its operation was beautifully simple. If the wind shifted, it would hit the side of the fantail, causing it to spin. Through a series of gears, this would automatically turn the entire cap until the main sails faced the wind again and the fantail would stop. It was a self-correcting system, a mechanical brain that kept the mill at peak efficiency without the miller lifting a finger. It's a perfect example of how these anonymous engineers were constantly innovating. The new village heartbeat. The arrival of a windmill was a transformative event. The rhythmic creak of its sails and the rumble of its stones became the new heartbeat of the village, a symbol of progress. The most profound change was a staggering leap in productivity. A single windmill on a good day could do in 30 minutes what might have taken a family nine hours of backbreaking work by hand. This was a liberation of time and energy on an unbelievable scale. Women who had borne the brunt of hand grinding now had more time for other work like spinning or weaving that could bring in extra income. This efficiency created a surplus. For the first time, a village could reliably produce more flour than it needed. This surplus became a product to be sold, connecting the village to a wider economy and bringing in cash. This broke the geographic monopoly of the watermill, opening up new plains and hillsides to efficient agriculture. With this new tech came a new powerful figure, the miller. He was a mix of technician, engineer and businessman. He had to dress the stones and repair the complex gears, and his position gave him immense influence. However, this often bred suspicion. The miller worked alone, controlling the flow of the village's most precious commodity. He took his fee, the mulcher from the grain itself, and the stereotype of the dishonest miller with a thumb of gold pressing the scales to take a bigger share was widespread. A popular medieval riddle asked, what is the boldest thing in the world? A miller's shirt, for it clasps a thief by the throat daily. The windmill itself became the new town centre. It was a landmark, a hub of social activity where farmers waiting for their grain would exchange news and conduct business. But the windmill also sparked a new conflict over a simple question. Who owns the wind? Feudal lords had long held milling monopolies through their control of rivers. When peasants began building their own mills, harnessing a force that seemed free to all, it was a direct challenge to that power. Lords fought back, sometimes claiming the wind over their land was also their property, and destroyed mills built without their permission. The windmill became a symbol of both liberation and struggle, a machine grinding away not just grain but the rigid structures of the feudal world. From the backbreaking toil of the quernstone to the majestic sweep of a tower mill's sails, the story of the medieval windmill is about a world transforming itself from the ground up. This was a revolution driven not by kings, but by ordinary people and skilled craftsmen who looked at the world around them and saw possibility. They were the forgotten engineers of their age. Without modern science, they mastered complex principles of mechanics and power transmission. They created a motor that on a good day could generate between five and 10 horsepower, a staggering amount of energy for the pre-industrial world. This wasn't just about making flour. It was about buying back time, the windmill was an engine of liberation that powered an economic boom and reshaped the social landscape. The very understanding of gears and natural forces born inside these creaking wooden structures was the mechanical DNA that would centuries later lead to the Industrial Revolution. Today, the few surviving windmills are silent sentinels. It's easy to see them as simple artefacts, but they are monuments to a powerful truth, that ingenuity isn't owned by the rich and powerful that groundbreaking innovation can come from humble places, and that sometimes the machines that change the world are built with resourcefulness, skill, 
and a revolutionary idea. Thanks for joining me on this one. Let me know in the comments, what other incredible inventions from history do you think are criminally overlooked? Now go build something timeless.